thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, Korea Global Forum for Peace 2019 that is co-hosted uh, by Sejong Institute and the USIP. So before I forget, I want to thank uh, Frank uh, for uh, hosting us today. And I know it's very tiring in the afternoon to have a, a conference like this, but I believe Matt, that he's going to be like, it's going to be like for him to speak like 5 a.m. in the morning because he just arrived yesterday. So it, it's not tiring, okay? <laughs> So this session is about the, the current status and the prospect of peace economy on the Korean Peninsula. So we are going to discuss uh, one of the area that uh, Minister Kim hyun chul mentioned in his speech. And before we begin, I have a quick advertisement that Sejong Institute uh, just published a book on North Korean economy, the titled demystifying the North Korean economy. So I have like a couple copies. So if you are very active in the discussion, I'm going to give out to you. <laughs> and uh, you all know the, our like prominent panelists. I'm going to be very brief introducing them. Uh, from my left, uh, Dr. Kim Sang-gi, a uh, friend of mine who is now advising Minister Kim hyun chul at the Ministry of Unification, and Professor Park kyung hye of University of British Columbia, and Dr. Hazel Smith at the Wilson Center, and we have Dr. Lee young Un of SK Research Institute for Specs Management. So without further ado, I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Kim Sang-gi for his presentation. Uh, please use this uh, interpreta interpretation device. Uh, I'm going to speak in Korean. Uh, what I would like to say today is uh, that the Korean government um, is um, proposing a peace uh, economy, and so I'd like to uh, explain that a little bit at this point. Some people say that the uh, North Korean um, talks have uh, are at an impasse, and uh, talking about economics is uh, kind of um, too early, or uh, it's too much in the future. But I don't uh, think that uh, that way. I think the uh, window of opportunity is open and uh, the uh, negotiation deadline that North Korea suggested, uh, the end of the year is still um, some time left and uh, I think that we still uh, can make some progress before then. And uh, if we use the opportunity uh, effectively uh, then uh, next year, I think, can be a different situation from this year. And, of course, I think that we need to, uh, our governments, uh, both our governments and North Korea, need to make efforts to uh, make this uh, happen. So as an introduction, um, that's I wanted to say that, but then I wanted to talk about what is peace um, the economy and what is it and um, uh, explain it a little bit. Um, the reason why Korean government is proposing this is that um, the peace on the uh, pen Korean Peninsula um, has been continuing and prosperity has been uh, deteriorating also. And if we look at uh, the Korean um, economy also, we need a new uh, motivation. Um, and also North Korea uh, is uh, also uh, focusing on its economy. Um, but uh, co-prosperity between North and South Korea is um, conditional upon denuclearization and uh, establishment of a peace regime on the East Con uh, Korean Peninsula. So uh, that's the background that our government uh, 
uh, stays as a premise for this Korean economy, a uh, peace economy. So what is it? It means that uh, peace is becoming a basis, a fun fundamental um, base, and uh, a means for solidifying uh, e the econo economy. So it uh, will help create a vicious cycle. So based on uh, peace, um, e economic prosperation can be um, the instabilities of um, war and uh, military tension can be reduced and therefore economic uh, cooperation and prosperity can increase uh, trade and logistics and finance uh, can be increased between North and South Korea. And so um, it, beyond the Korean Peninsula, uh, it, we can uh, continue um, this prosperity uh, towards the continent and to the uh, to the seas, and so prosperity will be expanded in this way. Also, through economic uh, cooperation, um, peace can be solidified. Through uh, economic cooperation, uh, there is will be a common uh, ground, and so. Um, this can deter conflict between the two Koreas and uh, create an environment for sustainable peace on the Korean Peninsula. So this is uh, the peace economy uh, core uh, principle um, forwarded by the Korean government. And if we look f historically after the World War II in Europe, there was the um, steel um, and coal co-op that was created, and it is in a similar to that situation. In this way, uh, then what kind of tasks uh, or visions does this peace economy have? Um, the vision means that based on this um, uh, e e economy, uh, there is a basis, for, based on peace, there is a basis for co-prosperity, and this um, co-prosperity will not only happen on the Korean Peninsula, but Northeast Asia will also be actively involved in this uh, prosperity. So in other words, the uh, Korean uh, market will become one, and so the um, seas on the, uh, on the south and the uh, continent on the north will be also tied as a regional um, arena for prosperity. So this, for this vision, uh, what kind of tasks need to be um, conducted? First, peace has to be secured on the Korean Peninsula, and uh, North and South Korea has to develop. And uh, establishing peace on the Korean Peninsula, um, the former speakers uh, already talked about denuclearization and um, uh, reduction of military um, arms. Uh, this uh, is all included and will um, lead to more interaction between North and South Korea and transaction, increased transactions and um, uh, periodical uh, meetings uh, between uh, governmental officials. Uh, secondly, through economic cooperation, there can be a new uh, economic environment on uh, on the Korean Peninsula. On the east, there would be um, energy and uh, tourism belt, and um, so Kumgang Mountain and Wonsan and Kalma area, uh, Masingyong um, ski uh, resort, and uh, Sarak Mountains. Uh, there will be a special uh, tourist area that can be uh, established. On the west coast uh, will be uh, for trade and commerce, and uh, there will be a um, uh, railroad that uh, connects the uh, two Koreas and then uh, will uh, create a uh, logistical network um, where uh, conventional and uh, new industries can be uh, created. Um, and the DMZ, um, Peace and Prosperity Belt, uh, will be a part of this. And so that will be ecosystem and uh, resources and uh, DMZ uh, economic uh, 
a special economic zone will be created. Thirdly, um, this will be expanded to the continent and the seas. To the north, there is Central Asia and Russia and China. And to the south, there's India and Southeast Asia. And uh, there will be new policies towards the north and the south. And a common railroad project will be a main uh, core of this uh, initiative. And in implementing uh, this new uh, plan, what can we expect? I think we can uh, talk about three things. First, the um, scale of the economy uh, will be expanded, and there will be a new motivation for growth. Uh, if we look at the um, population, if we talk about North and South Korea together, there will be a one market that is uh, uh, 80 million uh, people. And so this will be a new market that is uh, available for the uh, industries. And also, North and South uh, industries, if uh, new opportunities are given, there will be new jobs created. And there can be new jobs created. And the overall uh, level of uh, the citizens' um, everyday life will be uh, increased, enhanced. And uh, slow growth uh, can be overcome. The second uh, thing we can expect is that um, the uh, through the continental and sea oceanic expansion, uh, we can expand uh, roads and uh, infrastructure such as uh, trains, especially uh, connecting to the north will be a north-south uh, railroad that will lead to Eurasia and uh, expand towards uh, Eurasia. And along with uh, roads and um, railroads, uh, related um, industries will also develop, and uh, tourism is uh, one of these industries. And then finally, uh, we can talk about one other expectation. Uh, currently, Korea is uh, continually in a state of military tension. I think uh, you may have heard of Korea discount. There is uh, less uh, credit rating, and there is uh, a lower ability to invest. Uh, so if we talk about uh, peace economy, instead of Korea discount, we can talk about Korea premium. And so uh, the increase in credit ranking, as well as a new creation of new jobs uh, will be possible, as well as uh, new investments, uh, activation of new investments, which will uh, contribute to activation of the economy. So that's all I had. Is it on? Okay. Um, I, I first of all would like to echo my colleagues and say thank you to the Sejong Institute, to USIP and to Frank in particular for inviting me today. It's a particular pleasure for me because I was a USA, USIP fellow at the previous building in 2001, 2002, where I wrote one of my earlier books on North Korea, and it's great to be here. I'd only seen a model of it before, so I've never been in the building before, so thank you very much. Um, I'll, I'll try to be brief, uh, I, and I understand my mission is just to provide a few talking points, and it's been a long day, so maybe I'll just provide a few controversial talking points based on some of my research. Um, the two questions I was given to respond to uh, by Frank were, are, what are the implications of the current state of diplomatic negotiations on South Korea's efforts to build a peace economy? And the second one, are there alternative ways to strengthen inter-Korean and regional economic cooperation, assuming little or no sanctions relief? So I'll start, try to stick to the brief. So in terms of the first question, the implications of the current state of diplomatic negotiations, uh, I think the simple answer is that... Um, until some progress is made in US, US DPRK negotiations, US DPRK, 
all the rest of them notwithstanding, the South Korean government is not likely to go ahead with implementation of any economic strategy that involves any form of economic investment in the DPRK, despite all the very laudable aspirations for what could be done uh, if there was peace. Um, and this is because, and I want to argue this, that the South Korean government has adopted a very conservative inter interpretation of the UN sanctions regime. So, at the risk of repeating some of the things that, have, that were talked about in the earlier um, session, but to set the scene, because I was asked to talk about uh, the peace economy in the context of the diplomatic relations, uh, and diplomatic negotiations, if we can just recap, you know, we had a Singapore agreement which set out the broad goals agreed by the US and the DPRK, um, the commitment to establish new US DPRK relations in accordance with the desire of the peoples for peace and prosperity, uh, United States and DPRK join efforts to build a lasting and stable peace regime, reaffirming of the Panmunjom Declaration, uh, working toward DPRK committing to, walk, to work towards the complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, and the commitment to recovering the POWMIA remains. So there is an agreed joint statement between the mission goal in terms of the US and the DPRK, which is certainly a step forward over the many, many years of negotiations that have taken place between the US and the DPRK. So the big question is the operationalization of those goals. Now, both sides are verbally committed to diplomacy, but the issue is whether this is a diplomacy in the classical sense, whereby both sides engage in step-by-step -step negotiating based on compromise and reciprocal concessions, the only time you don't do that is if you've overwhelm, overwhelmingly defeated your enemy in war and then you can impose what you like on them. Um, or is it a question that these negotiations are simply a, uh, a meeting place in order to restate maximalist positions? Now this matters in terms of what can be achieved and it's an open question and a talking point as far as I can see. The latest uh, around, as we all know, was in Stockholm. Uh, DPRK ended the talks. Uh, the US was pretty positive about the fact that some things were discussed openly in the, in the talks. We haven't got a public record of the whys and wherefores of what happened in the talks, um, but we know, and it was restated uh, uh, recently, that the policy of both the United Nations and the United States was that unless the DPRK agreed first to complete irreversible and verifiable nuclear disarmament, then no sanctions could be, concessions can be made, whereas the policy of the DPRK is to demand security guarantees uh, as a condition of disarmament and in the short term some sanctions concessions. Um, I think that that really means if those, if those positions didn't change in Stockholm, irrespective of the fact that eight hours discussion took place, uh, that it's doubtful if we're going to see much progress in order for a peace economy discussion to go forward. Um, the North Koreans are not going to uh, spell out what they see as a final outcome, which is what was demanded, I understand, in the negotiations. Um, they also see a further extrapolation of the uh, Singapore declaration in terms of broad goals as for their perspective is simply a, an, another expre expression of bad faith, which they argue was displayed in the Hanoi summit when they thought they were going to get an agreement and then there was another demand put on the table. So one question is, given these two opposing sides, is, are there any steps that the DPRK could take that didn't include CIVD, uh, which might generate a reciprocal concession in terms of sanctions relief from the United States? If the answer is no, we're probably not going to get very far. And I would ask, and again, in terms of the peace economy that we're talking about, these are long-term aspirational steps, but we also have to think about the peace economy here and now for the 25 million people of North Korea who live in a much poorer country than in South Korea and for whom arguably it matters more that there's some form of economic support than, for the, than from the population of South Korea. And this relates to the changing diplomatic environment uh, for the North Korean negotiators. And 
in as much in the same way that US negotiators have to take into account the changing environment, for instance, in the United States, the political environment, the changing environment in terms of allies, uh, it's a mistake to think that DPRK negotiating imperatives always stay the same. For instance, in February 2019 in Hanoi, uh, when the DPRK uh, demanded the, the lifting of a number of the post-2016 sanctions, at that time, North Korea considered it was facing mass starvation uh, later in the year, this year. And the reason for that was that the oil sanctions in particular uh, had been in effect for a year and the natural gas sanctions and the effect of them had, them had been to, to decimate North Korean agricultural production. Um, and I can talk about that, why that was, why that is in a minute if, if anybody was uh, interested in that. Uh, there are no domestic sources of oil in, in DPRK, so agriculture, as in every country in the world, is dependent on oil products, fertilizers, pesticides. So if you don't have oil or natural gas, then you have a, a destro destroyed agricultural uh, production, which is what happened in North Korea. In fact, this, the oil sanctions, the post-2016 oil sanctions, and we can go into detail about what they were, recreated the proximate causal conditions of the famine uh, that took place in the 1990s. Um, so the result of the one of not just of oil sanctions, but you know, a major causal effect was that the food deficit in 2018 was a million and a half tons out of a total of about five and a half million that's needed to feed the North Korean population, 25 million population. So a very large deficit compared to a normal deficit of about half a million in the previous years, which could have been substitute could have been. Uh, could have been filled through imports but of course if all your imports are banned you don't have import export income through which you can buy imports so there were big big incentives for the North Korea to come to some form of deal based around the lifting of oil sanctions not all oil sanctions but back up to the September 2017 uh, limit for instance which was reduced in December 2017 but those imperatives have changed now in terms of the negotiating environment because uh, Xi Jinping visited DPRK this year and guaranteed that there would be no starvation by giving a million tons of food aid to North Korea. And that meant that although the economy can't grow in North Korea, they've lifted the, the, the threat of starvation which existed in, in the, at the time of the Hanoi summit, summit is now lifted. The, the result of all that uh, in terms of the negotiating environment and then in terms of the likelihood for a peace economy are that the trade, North Korea's trade is tiny anyway compared to world trade. So coal and textiles exports, uh, which are banned, are tiny, tiny, tiny uh, uh, for in world terms and tiny in terms of China trade, which, which receives most of, the, of these exports. And arguably these can be circumvented by bilateral deals with Chinese provinces. Um, the uh, oil sanctions are unenforceable now because they're unrealistic. China's not going to allow uh, North Korea a, a big starvation in North Korea similar to the 1990s anymore. Uh, and also what this means is that China, uh, uh, the North Korea has had to admit this year that it's wholly dependent not just on Chinese trade but on Chinese assistance not just for not just for prosperity, but for simple survival of the population. And this changes the strategic balance in uh, East Asia because although the North Koreans hate dealing with the Chinese, they've had to accept that they are now completely dependent on China. And this gives China, along with Russia, uh, a, a rather large negotiating clout. And it does mean that if China and Russia also come forward with a deal, which they argue uh, partially comes up with a nuclear freeze over the next months or year, that they, can, uh, they could put this to the Security Council. If the Security Council doesn't accept it, they could go ahead with it anyway, because North Korea is a Chinese and Russian neighbor. It's not a US neighbor, and, uh, and it, can, uh, it can manage to uh, get along with trade, provided China and Russia uh, support them. So coming back to the title... The practical ways to support projects uh, by the South Korean government are perhaps to be a bit bolder uh, in terms of the implementation of the projects that it's got on the table. There are no reasons why some of the development projects could not be marketed as humanitarian projects. There's no reasons why South Korea couldn't give lots and lots of scholarships overseas in Indonesia, in Asia, in India, in China uh, for North Korean students to study abroad. 
Um, there's no reason really not to implement the the North Korean census, which has been developed with the uh, with the UNFPA and which South Korea promised to fund. It's about $29 million, but was stopped because it involved computers. The outcome of that census would give a transparent uh, look into North Korean society. We'd all benefit from the information. We could compare it to the 2008 census. If North Korea goes ahead with it on its own, it won't be transparent. So there's lots of things that South Korea can do. But to go back to my premises, I think there's been, for very understandable reasons, a very conservative interpretation uh, of... Uh, of the sanctions regime. So in the short term, perhaps, the, if, as I was asked to, I was asked this question, I don't want to be impertinent in interfering in South Korea's decision-making. It's nothing really to do with me. I'm an observer. But I think that there is a possibility for some bolder interpretation, even given the current uh, situation of, of, uh, of what projects could be implemented, um, even within the sanctions regime. Uh, thank you, Hazel. Uh, now I'm going to ask Professor Park kyung -hye. And as uh, most of you already knew that uh, Professor Park is a frequent visitor of North Korea, and she also uh, has a great length of experience in like helping North Korea students like study like uh, elsewhere. Uh, so please, Professor Park. I don't know. Is it on? Well, uh, thank you. It's nice to be back to uh, USIP. Uh, to, uh, I was here in April and then see uh, my colleagues from uh, USIP and also my colleagues from Korea. It's great and thanks for uh, the invitation. Uh, as Hazel uh, said, uh, we were asked to uh, uh, address uh, two questions um, or to answer the questions. <laughs> Uh, what's, what are the implications of current diplomatic uh, negotiation on South Korea's PC economy, and uh, what are the uh, what can we do to strengthen inter-Korean uh, relations uh, given the uh, sanctions regime? Well, I guess the fundamental cause of the ongoing impasse uh, between the two countries is that uh, inter-Korean relations are subordinate to uh, the U.S.-North Korea relations and uh, uh, the absence of any agreement so far between U.S. and North Korea left to South Korea struggling uh, to define the next, uh, uh, the next steps. Meanwhile, Pyongyang sees itself entering into the uh, negotiation table uh, 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 from a position of strength, not position of weakness because of uh, its uh, powerful deterrent to nuclear weapons and uh, at demanding the United States uh, to stop hostile policy, to guarantee uh, North Korea's uh, right to survival and the right to development. So what are the implications uh, on uh, South Korea's PC economy then? Well, as we all know, uh, President Moon in September at uh, his UN speech, uh, he says that South Korea intends to create peace economy uh, whereby peace can lead economic uh, cooperation uh, with North Korea, which in turn will reinforce uh, 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 peace all working in a virtuous uh, cycle. In principle, I think the peace development nexus uh, makes good sense for the economy of both North and South Korea. Uh, the conventional wisdom between uh, uh, on uh, economic development and peace was that economic development was a precondition uh, for security. But later, this argument was increasingly put into question because uh, economic growth alone does not prevent conflict. So with the view that instability uh, hinders development, many literature began to argue for conflict-sensitive uh, economic uh, cooperation and uh, for strategic peace building as a factor to be considered in economic cooperation. So in this context, having peace building, uh, conflict prevention, and uh, reconciliation as objectives in designing the future inter-Korean uh, economic cooperation makes a good sense to me. Also, I think uh, the, the idea of peace economy uh, could be appealing to North Korea, to Kim Jong-un, uh, the issues of peace, issues of economy, uh, are not only issues for state security, but also issues for his own regime security. So any success 
uh, in virtuous cycle of PC economy uh, could consolidate uh, his legitimacy. Well, in this situation, North Korea would welcome South Korea's PC economy building, uh, perhaps studying with uh, uh, Mount Gumgang project uh, and uh, Kaesong uh, industrial complex project. However, the problem is that uh, South Korea, unfortunately, has not been able to deliver the virtuous cycle of uh, PC economy yet uh, due to uh, deadlocked nuclear negotiations. So to Pyongyang, South Korea uh, has strategic values only when it is capable of persuading the United States to ease sanctions, only when it's capable of creating the right conditions f to implement inter-Korean economic uh, cooperation. So uh, currently, Trump touts North Korea's no missile test, no nuclear test as evidence of uh, his big success in his uh, bromance uh, diplomacy. Unlike Trump, Kim Jong-un has nothing to claim. He does not have anything uh, to have credit for, except the fact that uh, Kim Jong-un has met with the President of the United States, which is not a big deal to North Koreans. Uh, so, um, in South Korea, in spite of uh, political disputes, more than 60% of South Koreans uh, support the reopening of uh, Kaesong Industrial Complex and uh, uh, resuming Gungang Mountain project. But uh, as we all know, South Korea cannot do this, cannot deliver this uh, because the UN sanctions uh, prohibit uh, transfer of uh, bulk uh, cash. So in this uh, uh, the uh, background, uh, in October, Kim Jong-un uh, ordered the destruction of South Korean facilities in uh, Gungang Mountain and announced uh, North Korea's uh, plan to build its own and, uh, and said that there is no room for South Korea to cut in, in a quotation. Uh, that deals a, a major uh, setback to uh, South Korean government, unfortunately. However, I don't uh, interpret uh, this North Korean move uh, as Pyongyang's intention to exclude completely uh, South Korean investors and businesses. Rather, I think Pyongyang is expressing its frustration over the protracted suspension because the Gungang Mountain uh, was, uh, was not uh, developed, uh, has not, couldn't, could not be developed in the last 10 years. Well, let me tell you a, a bit about uh, the North Korea's love for tourism. Well, currently, as we all know, the tourism is one of the most important sources of hard currency. Uh, I went to Pyongyang a few times this year, and every time I uh, found the Korea Hotel where I'm staying, full of uh, the tourists uh, from China mainly, of course, but uh, also from uh, European countries. Uh, sometimes it's hard to buy airline ticket uh, for, uh, uh, to Pyongyang from Beijing, you see. Uh, one time I had to directly contact North Koreans and look, can you get me a ticket <laughs> so that I could go? And uh, the, the train ticket from Beijing to uh, Pyongyang, is, it's uh, impossible buying train ticket, even for North Koreans, you see, because of all these tourists. Well, this time I went to Mount Chilbo, which is well known as uh, Mount Kumgang of uh, North Hamgyong province, right? Um, from Pyongyang, you have to take a domestic flight uh, to Orang. There are two, dom two flights a, a week. And uh, Orang is about three and a half hour drive from uh, Chilbo. Well, uh, when I went there, uh, I asked the uh, stewardess, oh, how many seats do you have in this flight? Because it was packed, full. She said 150 seats, no seat at all, no empty seat. On our way back, we were uh, even asked if we could take next flight. Next flight meaning three days later, right? And we said, no way, <laughs> why? They probably overbooked. And, and they said, they even offered, oh, we'll refund you, your airfare. <laughs> and so uh, we had to argue with them more than an hour to retain our seat in that plane. Uh, so, um, 
the Chilbo, although it is one of the six most beautiful mountains in North Korea, but not developed at all. No hotel, uh, no paved road, no infra, nothing. Only homestay. Uh, but I was surprised to see uh, uh, the tourists from China and also from Europe and uh, also from Canada. <laughs> um, the, uh, the people uh, in people running the business there, they seem to be relatively well to do because they deal with the cash all the time, right? And then every transaction was done in yuan, Chinese, um, you know, uh, yuan. Uh, and and uh, they said uh, Chinese, Chinese, they uh, come to Chilbo area all year round. So these North Koreans, they sell uh, tourists, uh, mountain vegetables and uh, seafood because like Kungang, Chilbo is surrounded by mountain and ocean. The, the, the woman who hosted us in her house, uh, after work, she had her own laptop. After work, she turned on her laptop and watched the movie. And I asked her, what, are you, what movie are you watching? I said, oh, Indian movie, uh, I, you know, Indian movie. And uh, she was wearing a thermal, uh, what do you call it, a hair cap. And I asked, why, why, what is that? What, what are you wearing? She says, oh, this is for uh, nourishing my hair. So thermal uh, nourishing hair cap every night. I've never used that in my whole life. And, and so, uh, you know, likewise, tourism is a booming business in North Korea. And the Kumgang Mountain is the cream of the cream in their tourism business, right? And so uh, 10 years of uh, no progress frustrates North Korea, and this in turn um, threatens South Korea's efforts to build peace economy, I think. So uh, what do we need to do? I mean, I don't know what uh, we need to do, but then he, was, he asked us to uh, uh, address this. So three things. Uh, one, uh, as I said, the uh, inter-Korean uh, economic co cooperation heavily depends on uh, the Washington's willingness to support the easing sanctions. I know uh, Washington here, uh, everybody well, you know, here from my colleagues, everybody is gloomy about the picture, right? However, uh, South Korean government might need to negotiate harder <laughs> to uh, obtain maximum flexibility. Uh, somebody mentioned the snapshot, uh, the, the snapback uh, provision uh, and all that. So uh, we, the, the, uh, uh, certainly, uh, you know, uh, al although it is very difficult, I think uh, at least the South Korean uh, give it a try. And secondly, um, the uh, Seoul might allow for South Korean companies to, uh, might allow some room for South Korean companies to uh, work directly or negotiate directly with North Korea if uh, North Korea reaches out to them. Uh, so that, uh, uh, particularly for the Kungang Mountain uh, tourism, so that uh, they could be prepared for their future business with Pyongyang uh, once uh, uh, sanctions are lifted. As I mentioned earlier, I don't think North Korea will completely exclude South Korean private businesses because uh, they need not only investors, but also they need knowledge, expertise, and also uh, uh, experiences of South Korean companies in resort development and particularly uh, ecotourism. Uh, the Kim Jong-un emphasized the ecotourism in Gungang Mountain. Uh, and uh, third, uh, as, uh, uh, as, uh, as, as uh, it was mentioned, uh, as a person who's doing, uh, uh, trying to do uh, the, uh, the human capacity building in North Korea by uh, inviting uh, North Korean professors every year, six professors for their six month study at my university. I've been doing this for nine years, so more than 50 people uh, have, uh, uh, have come to uh, my program, Knowledge Partnership Program. So uh, as uh, I think a, a strategic peace building, uh, 
the four strategic peace building South Korea might encourage and support capacity building program, as uh, uh, you mentioned. Uh, as Yuan Galtung says, uh, peace building implies something more dynamic, something more positive uh, than uh, creating uh, stability. And it uh, revolves around the notion of capacity building, uh, good governance, and like that. And so enhancing human capacity building, uh, the, by enhancing human capacity building, I think South Korea's PC economy nexus could be broadened and, uh, and uh, deepened. And these uh, human capacity building programs could promote sustainable peace economy, particularly in conflict-affected uh, countries like uh, North and South Korea. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Park. Uh, last but not least, uh, we have Dr. Lee Young un And I forgot to mention that he is the uh, main contributor of this book, which I'm going to give away after the session. Dr. Lee, please. Yes, nice to meet you all. Um, the content of my uh, presentation is about the recent changes in the North Korean uh, economy and its effects. Um, why I want to explain this is that recently, the changes in North Korea, um, not a lot of people know about this. And so I think we need to uh, focus on this topic. Uh, first, um, the um, North Korean sanctions have began in 2014, um, and uh, but in 2016, and um, the influence of these uh, sanctions have not really been that severe. Um, so, if we do a comprehensive analysis, in 2018, about eight percent inflation. Uh, occurred in the North Korean economy. And if we uh, go deeper, um, oil and petroleum um, was very uh, fluctuating uh, because they're very uh, foreign dependent, but the others were very quite stable. So um, beyond, despite our expectations, the sanctions uh, influence was not that great. So why is this? Uh, this may be because uh, the nuclear threats have increased, and um, we have seen the sanctions implemented, but we haven't really looked deep into the economy of the North Koreans. So, um, what is uh, the main? What are the main changes? I'd like to focus on three main points. First, is uh, uh, innovation, and uh, two, second. Um, is uh, the change in uh, the uh, path forward. Uh, first, um, the innovations, economic innovations have uh, occurred and um, they become uh, systematized uh, after a certain amount of time. Um, it's not only affecting uh, industries, um, but also it affecting uh, finance as well. So it's an overall uh, change in the uh, transformation in the Korean economy. And the second point, and this is very important, uh, industries or uh, co-op um, agriculture uh, agricultures uh, are given uh, real power. In the past, uh, the um, government did the planning and they did the selling and distribution, um, and the government was responsible for that. But now, uh, the industries themselves are given the freedom to do that. And so uh, they uh, need to be uh, responsible by themselves. And so as a result, the competition between the industries have become uh, very high. So they uh, want to sell something that will sell. And then uh, after paying um, some of the profits to the government, they need to uh, reinvest that into uh, managing their industry. 
and so it becomes a brand industry. It used to be a monopoly system, but now it's uh, more of a competitive uh, economy industry. For example, in the smartphone industry uh, until last year, there were only three companies that were um, competing. But now there are new, uh, two new companies that existed. So there are five uh, cell phone companies that are um, competing for uh, consumers. So this is not uh, only mobile phones. It's cosmetics, it's TVs. Everything has changed to a competitive economy. And so um, the name, uh, number of products, uh, the quantity has increased, and uh, qualitatively, the quality has also increased as well, as well as diversification of products. This is a big change. And then in the past, in China and uh, Vietnam, these are things we couldn't see in those countries. Um, IT has been uh, integrated so that the changes uh, have been very uh, large scale, and so, um, uh, e-commerce, for example, or uh, credit use of electronic uh, card systems has uh, uh, quickly taken place. So if we look at these changes, um, based on these, the domestic uh, preference for domestic products um, has been uh, taking place uh, according to the pace of nuclear um, uh, projects. So as nuclear projects begun, uh, this um, trend has also increased as well. So um, consumers are looking for food uh, domestically and other consumer products domestically. And so they are now substituting uh, domestic products for Chinese products. Um, so electronics such as uh, smartphones, smart TV is uh, uh, developed uh, within North Korea, and uh, still uh, they uh, may not have enough components, but uh, they still have uh, reached a certain amount of uh, domestic uh, manufacturing. And uh, also, uh, the military route ha path has changed to a, uh, an economic uh, path, and so uh, this is not just rhetoric, but it, uh, on a practical sense, this is uh, occurring. So military troops, for example, um, are being changed into a production facility, or um, uh, troops are being input into production facilities, or um, military facilities, um, production facilities are changed to civilian production facilities. And um, as a result, um, even within, uh, in the midst of uh, economic sanctions, there, uh, they, uh, North Koreans still have a survival uh, ability. In other words, um, even in the midst of economic sanctions, uh, they uh, can uh, produce a supply that is uh, stable. And these aspects are reflected in the everyday lives of uh, Korean uh, North Koreans, and you can look at the specifics in this book, um, but what this tells us is the following. The, even though the uh, economic sanctions have strengthened, uh, the North Korean economy is still able to be uh, somewhat stable. And um, this has a, politive, a policy um, kind of uh, result that um, maybe uh, the economic sanctions are not having the effects that we had originally thought. Um, so they may be able to last longer than we had originally thought. And also, um, the stronger the sanctions, the, the more uh, North Korea is dependent on China. And uh, is this uh, is contributing to peace economy? These are some questions that come to mind. The authority as a moderator that I have, and I'm going to ask a question to Hazel. That one of the sentences that stands out to me during your presentation is that 
uh, Korean government is conservative in interpreting like sanctions. So could you elaborate more in what area you, you perceive that Korean government is conservative in interpreting U.S. sanctions? Uh, well, if I can just expand on one of the examples I already gave. The, the DPRK North Korea census has been planned for years now with um, the UN, UNFPA. All the plans are uh, very well advanced. Um, in 2008, the UNFPA also developed a census with the North Korean Central Bureau of Statistics. Because it was done in cooperative terms, it meant all the data became transparent and available to the international community. For those of you that haven't come across the 2008 census, it's available online. There's pages and pages and pages and pages of it. Now, it's fantastically useful information. It doesn't mean to say you have to use it to analyse it. For instance, one of the things it does is it tells us how many people are in different industries. Now, we know from other evidence that um, women particularly have to register in workplaces and then they go off to the market. But what, So we know that they're not working there all the time. But it just tell, tells us even that small thing about the, you know, where where women are supposed to work or where the composition of uh, what the composition of the economy is so providing you can analyze the information there's and that's the same in any country if you get information about a country there's there's hundreds you know thousands and thousands of data points there is a census from 93 but that wasn't developed that was done unilaterally by the north koreans and it wasn't done to international criteria 2003 it was uh, sorry in 2008 now, for a couple of years, the UNFPA had been working with the game with the same people, the Central Bureau of Statistics, and the South Korean government was going to fund this. And it was quite a modest amount. 29 million is not a great deal for, a, for the South Korean government. Uh, and the South Korean government, or I don't know which agency of the government is involved in it, but some agency of the government, uh, has decided to put it on hold because it involves computers, um, and that could be seen as a dual use. On no occasion has the South Korean government even put it to the sanctions panel that this would be useful for all of us, whether it's for defence, whether it's for humanitarian reasons, whether it's for development reasons, because we'd have all that information. Not only would we have the snapshot information for 2019, so it was done this year, but for the first time we could have proper comparisons back to 2008. So that's what I mean about not being bold. There's no, been no effort to do this because the South Korean government would be very concerned that it would be seen as, as problematic. However, when you've got a US pro president who is absolutely committed on one level to forms of engagement with North Korea, it's not like we had in the last years of the Obama administration when it was strategic patience and that there was a deliberate policy decision after the 2013 anyway, not to engage any of these projects. It seems that there is a window of opportunity. It might, not, it might still be closed. But there is a window of opportunity to put forward some of these projects. To be even bolder, I think there's an argument that could be made that the transport infrastructure project uh, involving the railways, of course it will benefit South Korea in the end in terms of uh, providing export uh, opportunities, uh, but it would also provide proper jobs for North Koreans in a transparent manner because there would have to be international oversight, uh, which would respond to some of the poverty uh, in the country, because although some people are making money, a lot of people, millions are not, and they're still facing the, the, the potential starvation uh, when, when you don't have a regular food su supply. So, yes, some people are making money, others are not. So these arguments have to be made, uh, even in the context of post-2016 sanctions. Of course, there are all the strategic issues, uh, but just because the United States and South Korea, for instance, are... Uh, in conflict about the future military relationship doesn't mean to say that this, the United States leadership or parts of it, given Ms. President Trump's commitment to wanting to push things forward, may not be amenable to an argument. Maybe they wouldn't be, but there isn't, these arguments are not being made. So that, that's the question. The reason I raised this was the question I was given was what can be done given sanctions? And it's a, it's a, it, that, that was simply to elaborate on what I thought perhaps could, there's a space there that could be, could be taken forward. Uh, thank you, Hazel. So, Sangi, well, what's your thought on the Hazel's uh, argument that Korean government is like, too conservative? Uh, 
어, 우리 한국 정부가 그 유엔 안보리 대북 제 The Korean government, um, in its interpretation of the North Korean uh, sanctions, I think that maybe um, the view was that it may be a bit overly uh, conservative. Um, but I think that there's really no uh, specific reason why we should be uh, overly conservative. And I don't believe that that is uh, mostly the case. Uh, but I think there may be some areas uh, where um, there could be some changes. For example, uh, some people may already know that North Korean uh, economic sanctions are very specific and uh, tight knit. For example, uh, laptops that um, Hazel uh, discussed. So uh, you cannot uh, import laptops into North Korea. So these uh, are very specific items. And so uh, these uh, sanctions themselves um, need to be um, uh, confirmed as unrelated to building a military power of North Korea. And so um, there are some of those instances where uh, there's kind of a gray area, and it may be difficult. Um, but the Korean government, um, basically, in terms of uh, North Korean sanctions, uh, UN sanctions, are um, meeting those sanctions are um, obeying those sanctions. And so other people may think from the outside that maybe North Korea, uh, the South Korean government is uh, overly conservative in interpreting uh, the uh, UN sanctions. But that is uh, actually uh, not uh, totally true. Um, from the floor that uh, one of my friends is uh, over there and uh, Dr. Jung ji Young from Fudan University who is now at Stimson Center. Since one of the elements that commonly mentioned by our panelists is China DPRK relations. So I'm going to ask uh, Professor Jung ji Young uh, to comment on China DPRK relations and its impact on the PC economy. Could you give him the mic, please? Thank you. I'll uh, speak in Korean. I have... Uh, lived in North Korea for a long time and I have also been to China quite a bit uh, over a hundred uh, occasions and uh, as such I think I can speak on the economic relationship between uh, China and uh, North Korea Uh, we understand uh, that the uh, North Korean economy is affected uh, by the uh, sanctioning uh, regime. Uh, but uh, does that mean that the uh, North Korean economy is about to collapse? I don't believe so. Uh, however, uh, U.S. Uh, really holds the key, uh, as the uh, North Koreans see, uh, for uh, reducing the sanctioning regime. And if uh, the Americans are truly uh, wanting uh, and intending uh, to have a better relationship with North Korea, uh, the U.S. must show uh, through its action uh, about the time is uh, ripe. Uh, that's the way the North Koreans uh, see the uh, issue as to whether North Koreans are really intent on giving up their nuclear uh, capabilities? Well, uh, I don't believe North Koreans are really at that uh, stage uh, because at this point, uh, North Koreans do believe uh, the nuclear capabilities are what sustains their regime and to ward off any uh, external threats uh, such as the U.S. So uh, the North Korean Koreans have not made up their mi mind to give it up. 
uh, but uh, they can eventually at some point uh, when they feel there is no need uh, to rely on the nuclear capabilities uh, to have a stable uh, regime and security other regime. And as to the economic uh, development, uh, the North Koreans are quite intent on that one, uh, that they have made up their mind uh, that uh, economic development is what the uh, regime would pursue as a priority uh, because uh, the uh, quality of life for the people of North Korea uh, goes hand in hand with the legitimacy of the regime of uh, North Korea under Chairman uh, Kim, as have been spoken of uh, quite a bit uh, here today. Uh, Kim's uh, method of uh, ruling uh, is uh, somewhat different from his uh, father, uh, his uh, predecessor. And uh, as such, uh, Kim Jong-un uh, seems to think that it is very important uh, for there to be an economic uh, development in order for his uh, regime uh, to continue to have uh, legitimacy in the eyes of his uh, people. Uh, the role uh, to be played uh, by the Chinese, well, uh, China is about the only country right now that uh, North Korea is uh, depending on economically, uh, and uh, be it a uh, certain type of uh, crucial uh, uh, products coming in uh, from uh, China or the hard currencies uh, coming in uh, through uh, these uh, tourisms and things like that. Uh, North Korea do want to open their uh, market and uh, their economy, uh, but uh, who would could they turn to? I mean, the only country they have right now is uh, China. And uh, so uh, out of necessity, uh, North Korea is uh, relying on uh, China. And uh, there have been in recent years uh, even closer relationship between the two countries. Uh, however, as you know, uh, sometimes uh, in order for us to step, uh, take two steps forward, uh, so one step back is necessary. 2019 had been a, a difficult uh, year uh, between South and North Korea, as I understand. Uh, going forward, uh, we have to rethink about uh, where uh, North Korea should be uh, putting their uh, dependence on. Uh, in China has become an even more important player in uh, North Korea's uh, economy. Uh, but uh, that also means uh, the influence of China has grown, and uh, through China, perhaps uh, changes can be had in North Korea, but whether that is to the benefit of South Korea uh, remains uh, to be seen. Uh, denuclearization is something that everybody uh, around North Korea is uh, pursuing, and uh, China can obviously play a very important and crucial role in that uh, regards. Time constraints. Now I'm get only like getting two questions from the floor. If anyone wants to ask questions, uh, on the back. Um, my name is Amy McEwen. I'm a financial analyst. If uh, if the travelers or the tourism that is coming from China are, Can you are speak? only from China. Um, how would it affect if the Chinese economy were to go through a, a negative or recessionary period? How would that affect South Korea through the, the North Korean behavior with sanctions? So we, we, we could barely hear you. Could, could you speak up a little bit? Yeah, okay. No, if, uh, if, if the Chinese were to enter into a recessionary period or go through an economic hardship, how would this affect South Korea and North Korea if, if the North Koreans are relying on tourism and if there are sanctions in place? Uh, of course, uh, there would be a negative effect uh, to North Korean economy if uh, China were to enter into a uh, depression or a re recession. Uh, 
Uh, however, as to the uh, the magnitude of uh, effect, uh, we have to consider uh, because uh, it would be limited to food aid and uh, perhaps some petroleum, uh, not as uh, much of an effect uh, because this would be a, a political concern, uh, a political decision made by the Chinese. The whole of East Asia and probably the United States and the UK, I mean the UK and the universities for example, depends on Chinese students now. So it's an important question uh, and, and it has very, very big ramifications because North Korea is very small in relationship to China. Then I guess it would depend upon Chinese strategic thinking about how important it was to um, subsidize North Korea to at least for it to end up with survival, which in economic terms would not be very much compared to China's ability to pay. Thank you. One last question. No one? Oh, okay, over there. <coughs> I would like to have a follow-up on the question just now. Recession in China uh, will have uh, some effect on the psyche of the Chinese uh, government uh, in involving itself into North Korea. What do you think? Because the, even the influence that the Chinese want to exercise over North Korea will uh, be affected uh, by what happens uh, domestically in China, right? I'm not sure uh, if I can address uh, Thank you. Maybe I'll uh, take a step at it. And as to North Korea, there would be a, a some effect, uh, but again, uh, the magnitude would be limited uh, because uh, for North Korea, the uh, support uh, and aid from uh, China are limited uh, in the categories. Uh, one is in the area of petroleum, about uh, 500,000 ton uh, per year, it looks like, uh, from China to North Korea. Uh, before it was a refined uh, petroleum, but now it's uh, not uh, uh, refined uh, ones. And also, I believe uh, there were some coming in uh, through uh, Russia. And so, uh, if not China, the Russians uh, will also provide the petroleums anyway. And then there's the food aid. On annual basis, uh, North Korea is in deficit for about uh, 500,000 uh, ton also. And uh, most of uh, these are coming from uh, China uh, as a, an aid. But other than uh, the food aid, uh, there's some fertilizers uh, coming from uh, China, uh, especially when it comes to harvest uh, seasons. Uh, you need uh, these fertilizers. Well, these are the aids uh, that you get. Uh, uh, there are also public works uh, that uh, China and uh, North Korea engage in uh, together. Uh, there are some public events uh, that are held uh, together uh, between the two countries. However, as uh, spoken of earlier, uh, the domestication of and localization of uh, many uh, manufactured products in North Korea uh, also means that there's less need uh, and dependence on Chinese goods. So having said that, uh, Kim Jong-un, uh, in the beginning of his uh, power, uh, he had a lot of problems uh, with uh, China and he was not happy uh, with the uh, Chinese government, uh, we know that, and the uh, unhappiness uh, has not actually gotten much better. And so the North Koreans, uh, the, as, the, as a population, are not all that fond of the Chinese anyway. 
Now, having said that, uh, the Chinese uh, recession, whether uh, that uh, would have a direct uh, effect and a large impact on the North Korean economy, I don't think so. I do not uh, think the magnitude will be all that uh, strong. It would just be limited, very limited. Uh, uh, the, since these are uh, uh, aids, uh, perhaps uh, they might be reduced a bit, but not a whole lot more than I did, right? <laughs> Last comment uh, for Hazel. Uh, yes, I would like to, I'd like to um, expand on the response I gave earlier. I think one of the things that's important, uh, uh, it was a very important question actually, uh, in terms of simple economic relationships, it all depends on what's happening, what the other variables are. Um, Professor Chong's right in that up until last year, the deficit the food deficit was about half a million tonnes. After the sanctions, the old sanctions of 2017 and 2018, the food deficit in North Korea was one and a half million tonnes. It jumped. This year, China's donated a million tonnes of food aid. That is an extraordinary amount. I mean, for those of you who don't deal with it, but it's an extraordinary amount. One of the reasons they've been able to do, with it, to do it is that China is producing large uh, grain surpluses. Um, some, South Korea did this uh, about 10 years ago under the Kim Dae-jung administration. It donated food aid, which was grain surpluses. It doesn't always happen that countries produce grain surpluses because they can change their agricultural policy so as not to do that. So there is a question as if those grain aid surpluses were not available in China this year. I think I, somebody might know, the, the, but I think it's three or four million tonnes surplus, I'm not sure. Um, would, would that million tonnes of aid if their agricultural deficit required it in North Korea, uh, would China buy that from somewhere or supply it? So there is a question there, and that would depend upon a number of different variables. But the broader issue is what happens if China, and to a lesser extent Russia, fall out with North Korea politically, uh, or if North Korea falls out with them, because as been rightly pointed out, the North Koreans don't like being subservient to China, they give a hard time to the Chinese officials when they go in there every few months to talk to them. They disrespect them, they insult them, uh, uh, believe it or not, even though they depend more and more dependent on China. This is not a hypothetical question because if we look back at 1991, 1992, it was the decision of China to start charging market prices for oil and oil products and other exports to North Korea and the decision of the Soviet Union and then Russia to stop uh, giving away fuel, uh, particularly, and other goods to North Korea, which precipitated agricultural production losses and industrial collapse such that we had the famine from 93 to about 1998 what WFP characterises as a famine in slow motion, but which the best research shows that nearly a million people died, this horrible term, extra deaths. Now, it wasn't the only cause, but it was the proximate cause, was the changes in policy by both China and Russia uh, in terms of the provision of inputs which were necessary for agricultural production. So it's an important question because diplomatic relations don't stay the same. Um, it's not always been that China and the, Soviet, and the former Soviet Union, then Russia, were amenable to supporting North Korea. And we can't be sure in the future that they would be amenable again, especially if North Korea has a nuclear test, because China will be furious if that happens. And we don't know what their, somebody might know here, but I don't know what their game plan is, but they will have one for if North Korea does a nuclear test, say, in the spring. Professor Park. Oh, I got, oh, English. <laughs> uh, well, um, I think as, as you mentioned, the, the area that uh, hit most uh, uh, hard uh, would be tourism. And the, uh, you know, the, uh, as, as tourism is the uh, most important sources of uh, uh, hard currency now uh, that would, could make uh, North Korean economy in trouble. Uh, the second area is the student exchange. A uh, lot of uh, North Korean uh, students are currently uh, 
studying in China, and uh, they many uh, North Korean students uh, received a PhD uh, in in China. Of course, they cannot take courses in science and technology area now because of sanctions, but at least in human, humanity and social science area, they are still, there are still many uh, students. But um, I think overall, uh, even if uh, Chinese, uh, uh, China has economic recession, I don't think China will completely abandon North Korea. Collapsing North Korea is a nightmare for uh, China. Uh, th thank you, uh, Professor Park, and I would like to thank all the panelists for their fantastic presentation, and I also thank you, audience, for staying with us. So before I turn the mic over to Frank for wrapping up, uh, I would like to ask you to join me, thank all our panelists today. Thank you.